this is time for our bonus content for the channel, and the tradition of this channel, what I do quite a lot and I get requested quite a lot for, from my viewers is to do a, what's called a creature review. So this time, for my dear viewers of AKRX channel, we're going to do a quick creature review of one of the creatures, specifically of a Tyrannosaurus Rex from Jurassic Park franchise. And uh, this time though, we're gonna have Dr. Thomas Carr with us doing this, and uh, things are gonna get a little bit more brutal and there will be no prisoners taken, I sense. I'm hoping at least. So uh, let's get into it. So okay. uh, the order I do it, let's uh, first open up perhaps the uh, maquette from which is called JP Rex, either maquette two or maquette three, whichever one of them suits you more. Sure. Let's do the three one, maybe third one, because it gives us a better side view of the creature. Yeah. So uh, first we start from the uh, meaning. So they uh, keep it. They name it Tyrannosaurus Rex. Is this correct? Yeah, I think that was their intent. That was their intent. So we, are, we agree that the naming was perfectly spot on. Now, uh, the size uh, that they provided, I believe, at least on the recent uh, Jurassic World website, because I treat only the actual movie, you know, uh, mentions where they actually mention it, or the relevant uh, licensed lore, that is directly related to the franchise as the canon. Anything outside of that, I call it a fanon, and I do not consider it as something we can take into account. Okay. So, they given it 12 meters length, their adult T-Rex, in yeah. the uh, span of the first and the second films. Is this something that is legitimate? Yep, yeah, 12 meters, 40 feet, roughly. So that's... I'd say give or take, that's pretty legit. Yeah, yeah that's, that's within error. And their mass estimate, however, I think was quite interesting. They pr it started off at six tons at first, before, and then they decided to give it an estimate of seven or eight tons, I believe, which is very interesting because mass seems to be one of the common issues of you know giving the correct value. Yeah, mass estimates are are pretty tricky. Um... I know that in recent years, based on the work of Campioni and Evans, I think the mass estimates for Rex has come down. It's gone down, not up. Uh, my memory's a bit hazy of what their estimate for T-Rex was, but that those numbers that you gave you know, would probably be within that range. Definitely seven tons would be the upper end of that range. So I think, based on my hazy memory, four to seven tons, that's you know, would be, would bracket the actual Rex mass quite nicely. At least we're talking about the statistical average from what we know from specimens, obviously. We're not talking about some individual specimens. Like, we don't know how common that sort of mass estimate was, because obviously, uh, you know, well, you, you obviously know Scott Hartman, who does the skeletal drawings, and uh, uh, he did a series of comparison posts about Giganotosaurus and uh, Tyrannosaurus, uh, that is Tyrannosaurus Rex and Giganotosaurus uh, Carolini, and uh, there seems to be like uh, the compromise that uh, holotype of Giganotosaurus, as in the only, I think, known complete specimen or nearly complete specimen that we have of it, versus the uh, specimen CU, turns out that it was actually lighter than uh, CU and just generally probably T-Rex, it barely reaches 7 tons according to Hartman, at least. So, uh, again, uh, where do you stand with those estimates of... Uh, because they seem to be... I mean, general uh, value of 7 to 8 tons seems to be the most popular that is represented in his reconstructions of mass, although he admits that they are quite tricky to uh, pinpoint anyway, which we have also pointed out. So, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, there's other... There's different approaches to estimating mass. And... For example, there's work done by uh, John Hutchinson and, and colleagues, and the estimates that they come up with for T-Rex, and this is based on several specimens, is generally somewhere between um, six and eight tons. So that there's some variation there, and that's based on individual animals. So the Jurassic Park estimates, you know, don't 
aren't much different from what uh, the scientists have come up with. And maybe that's evidence that they have, um, you know, that their con scientific consultants have passed that information along. Could be well the case, I'm pretty sure. Well, at least we can hope so, because that could yeah. mean that more progress might follow in future sequels, because we know that there is a sequel in 2018 coming out. And yeah. I am both excited and terrified at the same time, because I don't know what to expect. Because <laughs> part of me wants to see more dinosaurs on the screen, another part of me is just dreading that they might produce something so ridiculous that I'm just going to go unconscious at the very yeah. sight of it. I feel right. the same you're probably feeling the same, yes. <laughs> so uh, now uh, the next thing that I always look at is um, obviously the body plan. Now this is a very important part and one of the main issues, the anatomy and the reconstruction of, well, starting off from the skeletal as from what you can see, the proportions and the distribution of mass and the musculature from obviously what is provided to us based on what we have. Well, I think the the overall the overall sorry the overall proportions um, look generally generally correct. So you know the neck is about the same length as the head. The torso is about twice as long as the head. The hips are as long as as the skull, and the tail looks looks fine. And the proportions of the hind legs look uh, pretty good as well. Um, as my specific issues with the Jurassic Park Rex, uh, mostly center on the head. Um, Shall we switch to the head image, maybe close up? Um, so let's go to the, uh, where is it? It's the JP Rex head. So whichever one of them, uh, the left side or right side, let's go JP Rex head one. So here we go. So what can you tell us about the head issues? Well. Out of, out of all due respect to um, the studios that produced it. Yeah, Stan Winston, it, rest in peace. Yeah, um, but that's not... Artist. Yes, extraordinarily. Um, but in, in my view, if I were the consultant, um, the face would have looked pretty much completely different. Uh, <laughs> I like how many are pretty much completely and different other terms we put in one sentence. <laughs> yeah, that, that was far too awkward. But uh, like I said, uh, of, all due, of all due respect to both the studio and, and the consultants they were working with, um, the bottom line is that if you compare the skull shape of this model with an actual Rex skull, um, they they don't they don't match up, and uh, I don't know the reasons for that. Uh, there's also differences in the dentition that the teeth of an actual Rex are quite different than what's sculpted here. Um, research by Larry Whitmer shows that the nostrils actually positioned further forward on the snout and a bit lower on the snout. I think the, the eye could be shifted up and back. Um, so the, there's a lot of nitpicky details, but I think overall, um, just the, the face doesn't match what the actual skulls show. It, it's, a, it's an impression. So it's impressionistic. It's sure it's, you know, it's got a deep snout, deep lower jaws, the curved tooth row, the fat teeth, um, a tall skull, but just the, all the details are off. So it's, it's impressionistic, but not accurate. I think uh, one of the interesting parts that I think we both kind of can agree on, hopefully at least, because I think that's where I can point why I think it feels wrong, is that if you look at... Um, let me just see what's the better image for this purpose. If you go right here in the JP3 Rex 2, where it bites the quote-unquote Spinosaurus, um, you can sort of at least get a general idea of what the front would look like. And uh, I am a little bit puzzled how are these eyes supposed to face forward if they seem to be sinking towards the central more than they are kind of... Do you understand what I'm saying, where I'm going with this? Yeah. Like, the eyes should be able to see forward, which is one of the primary and, like, 
must have features for a T-Rex, in my opinion, because that distinguishes it from pretty much almost any other ther large theropod in particular. So what, what are your thoughts on that? That's a good image. Um, I haven't seen this still before. And yeah, that's ex you know the, it's extraordinarily wide across the snout, um, and in fact, I you know arguably it's it's too wide. And I also see the issue with the eyes, um, how they're effectively facing mostly to the side. There isn't much of a forward. Uh, there isn't much of a forward orientation there. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's. It's a funny thing. It's it's curious. Um, overall, um, you know, if we accept this image as accurate, the snout is definitely too wide across the top, and the widest part of the snout in T. Rex isn't at the front. It's actually about midway along the tooth row. So there's um, yeah a lot of little differences that add up to a face that I don't recognize, um, and you know uh, the the I guess the frustrating part for me is that it's not hard to get dinosaurs right. As long as you pay attention to the skull and the skeleton, it's not it's very easy to produce an accurate dinosaur. And given the high profile of, of Jurassic Park and the longevity and impact of the franchise, you know, I I kind of wish they'd They'd fix their wrecks. And now that we have mentioned that you are doing the ontogeny studies, this is a good example to look at. Given the context and the topic, it's perfectly appropriate in my opinion, don't you think, Dr. Carr? Yeah, boy, I really wish that I was consulted on this. I know, <laughs> I was gonna say, you're probably gonna say, if only this, this came out later, a little bit I later. Just wish, I just wish that they would have reference my 1999 paper because you know, I you know, this I came out in 97 that's the only problem so it was oh, right 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 so that's um, what I'm saying if only this would have come out later yeah. then we would have been able to get this in there but of course we have to make do with what we have so how much of it let's just say did they guess quote unquote correctly it's kind of, okay I'll just I'll, I'll just be straightforward here it's it's not accurate in, by any amount, um, and uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I, as I said, I, I wish, you know, I think at, at the time, um, I'm just, I'm just trying to think. Um, it's really think, tricky here because on one hand you've got the sufficient material yeah. but all of the stuff that's happened right here on the screen I mean that's been done before that came out so you kind of like it's a tricky one isn't it <laughs> yeah well what, what the reason why I'm hesitating is I'm just trying to think of when I made my first public presentation uh, when I sort of established myself as working on transfer growth and that was in 96 so yeah, I, I really was wouldn't have been on anyone's radar, but yeah, this is not what juvenile transfers looked like. No, and and we we know that thanks to the recent work of uh, Sushi et al. Uh, with the uh, transfers Batar juvenile skull, that really nice paper um, looks nothing like this, and that specimen would have been pretty much would have matched the size of of this model in the movie. So, so they they took a, a stab at it, and unfortunately, it's it's not successful. Um, I guess the most obvious issue is that it has what I call dog head. So, if you notice how the forehead, we see how the the forehead is separate from the snout, like a dog. Yep. <laughs> and I call that dog head, and and dinosaurs didn't, and particularly transfers didn't have dog head. Well, because they were not dogs. <laughs> yes. So it, it has what I call a bad case of dog head. I think the the recent Godzilla um, had a bad case of dog head too, unfortunately. Yeah, but that's like fiction, you know, fiction being material. Awesome, but fiction. Yeah. 
But the dog, I find dog head distracting, and, and this is probably the best example of dog head. And this is, and we know that they did not look like this. Um, and I think even before this film was made, um, there were subadult tyrannosaurs known, like the Cleveland skull, um, in particular, and they just don't look like this. And it, it's. You know that they tried. That they took a shot at it. Um, I but... tried. I tried. I tried. I failed. I failed. I failed. <laughs> oh, I guess they. You know, based on their working knowledge, this is what the best they came up with, and fair enough. It just depends. Let, let's on... agree that at least it's nicely painted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I presume that's not what you probably had in mind, but this yeah, is actually I... one of the things I wanted to touch up. Well, slightly later on, I wanted to... Well, yes, actually, let's do this now, and then we will move on to the last finalizing uh, part of the verdict. Yeah. But before we move to the verdict, let's analyze the color uh, variations that they have introduced. So what they have done was, throughout the series, they have established that the female Tyrannosaurus looks uh, brown, what, which we see in the first and the second film, and yeah. the male Tyrannosaurus uh, looks green, which we yeah. see in the second and the third films. So what are your thoughts in general on their choices of colors and how you see them represented based on the images I have provided? Yeah. Um, well, my approach to coloration in, in Tyrannosaurus and and dinosaurs in general is to use a crocodilian analog and that's an ecological analog. Um, and so in general, uh, when I have my artist, um, Dino Polera, say render horneri, I had him model the coloration and pattern of the head based on Cuvier's dwarf caiman as a, a red head and sort of patches on the lower jaw. Like a brick and, red sort of color thing. Yeah, brick red. It's it's a display. You know, it's a bright color. It's it's eye catching. And transor heads were ornamented with up to eight horns in some cases, and also the the rough snout. So I generally have the heads brightly colored, um, a la Cuvier's dwarf caiman. When it comes to the body. Um, I usually have the pattern match that of a crocodilian that lives in a, a similar environment. So, say with Horneri, it's a coastal plain uh, dominated by, uh, you know, meandering river systems. And so crocodilians we see in that sort of environment are, you know, Nile crocodiles and that sort of thing. So I generally have a brownish um, basement color and then darker blotches or, or spots. So, you know, it could be um, that transfers were dimorphic in terms of color or integument pattern. We don't know. Um, we don't see that in crocodilians. We know that in crocodilians that the juveniles, the hatchlings, are much more boldly patterned than the adults. And so I follow, uh, for better or worse, I follow the crocodilian pattern. Um, that's you know, just to put a leash on, on my inferences and what I present to the public is what, you know, is plausible. We have no way of knowing if it's accurate. I guess that there's different, uh, I guess I'll say this, um, you know, among my colleagues, I'm sure not, not all would agree with the approach that I take. I know that, that some would, um, but we're really shooting in the dark when we don't have the evidence. And so we have a real deficit of evidence here when it comes to coloration of scales that would require extraordinary, exceptional preservation of soft tissues or um, subcellular structures like melanosomes. And even then there's a limit to the colors that can be inferred. So I follow, for better or worse, the crocodilian model. Um, so that I stop myself from speculating. But even then, um, that's, you know, I don't know if I'm right, and I probably never will. 
Well, uh, let's let's hope for the best. But then uh, I can see like where this is the classic example that you just said earlier on that we have to be consistent with what we know and we have to accept maybe that even if there is a hint, we can still we cannot be sure. Uh, like as much as we would like for this to be true, we may not really know for sure. So, um, for example, um, like the. Uh, well, for example, the examples that you have provided uh, with the crocodilians, they themselves don't actually limit to a specific pattern as well. Like uh, Cuvier's Kaim, Dwarf Kaiman is just one of the many examples that you can yeah. use, perhaps. So it doesn't mean that all of them have to be green, all of them have to have red spots right. uh, in the snout. So we have, oh my goodness, we have a whole spectrum of shades between greens of light and dark and swampy and salad green, or you call it just whatever, palette. We've got yeah. brown, kind of yellowish. I mean, if you look yeah. at crocodilian specimens, there's probably quick, quite a lot of tons of different material to look at. And uh, I think that's what people sometimes underestimate. They think that yeah. this is narrowing it down. But in actual fact, guys, that's quite a lot of stuff. Yeah, there is. It's, they can be quite dazzling. You know, there's like the Cuban crocodile seen photographs where they're, they can be a dazzling black and gold. They're quite colorful animals. Do we think it's accurate or do we not? Shall we just make a decision or shall we just leave it open-ended? Well, I don't think... Uh, I wouldn't leave it open-ended because if I was consultant, say, on, on Jurassic World, the T-Rex would look different, and that includes the form of the head, uh, the form of the hips. They should be The ilia should be closer together. And the color pattern, too. And also the arms. I think they are too spindly and too far apart. So I, so to answer the question honestly, there are numerous adjustments I would make. And that does extend to the coloration of the integument. And out of all due respect to, to their artists and consultants. Well, we, we're not disrespecting here anybody. We're just giving honest opinions, me as an artist and you as a professional paleontologist. So I, I think it's fair to assume that we do not aim to offend or disrespect the work or, uh, you know, property and etc. of uh, these, uh, you know, contents. Yeah. I think that the important takeaway here is that in my view, there isn't much room for error. Like, that, there really isn't much latitude um, for screwing things up. Uh, one last thing on the appearance. Uh, is it fair to say that they guessed the integument type correct? So they were scaly, as we know from the evidence so far, until proven otherwise. So they are showing a scaly rex. So we yeah. agree that this is correct. Yes. Yeah, um, that's a very quick one as well. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, you know, and, and of course, there's some adjustments to be made on the face, like getting rid of the lips and, and having the armor-like skin and the keratin sheath. But you know, overall, yeah, I mean, they 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 got it. Cool. And behavior-wise, uh, of course, that's one of the things that probably Hollywood is guilty of. They show frequently that it seems well. T-Rex, not as much, but there are times when it makes me feel, especially in, uh, uh, like, the second film, when they pair, the mating pair, if you remember, in the second movie in 97, they are, once they got their juvenile back, they keep pursuing humans and keep trying to murder them the whole time. Almost up until the very, well, not the very end, but then, you know, there is a point where it just makes you feel like they just... I mean, dinosaurs chasing humans, wanting to murder them. How accurate could this be? Do you think they would be, like, they must be really either underfed or angry enough to want to murder humans? <laughs> uh, my expectation is that if I encountered a full adult T-Rex out on the street outside, I wouldn't last very long. I, I would expect my life to be very short from that that point onwards. So I don't think enough people were eaten in Jurassic Part 2. Actually, that's a good point, because I was hoping you would answer that. Many people seem to not uh, like, like the idea that dinosaurs want to murder humans in the movies. And uh, I mean... I think given the context in the behavior of T-Rex, I mean, their Spinosaurus, quote-unquote, again, in Jurassic Park 3, I think it was a bit over the top, because it seems that anywhere on the island where humans were, 
it was specifically choosing to go after humans instead of any other alternative source of prey. That was something that I was having a problem with personally because uh, it takes away my immersion factor and uh, realism. Do you understand where I'm going with this? Like, yes, I do. While with the T-Rex, it seems that they were just pissed off, quite frankly speaking, that they took their juvenile and then they are just walking around there looking like they are they, like they mean business in their territory. And uh, I think probably we could have had a bit more deaths, uh, human death characters by T-Rexes, I guess. Well, one thing to keep in mind that, you know, T-Rex was a product of natural selection. And so its senses were organized and its information processing in its brain was organized to assess the viability of prey. I'm pretty sure a, a, uh, an adult T-Rex, even though they're about, they're, they're pretty dumb compared to mammals, but about as smart as alligators, and alligators aren't that dumb for a reptile, a quote-unquote reptile, um, a T-Rex probably would have understood pretty quickly that humans don't move very quickly, and that a full adult T-Rex could probably walk as fast as most people could run. The reach of the step is quite big, and that's one of the other things that seems to be uh, striking people confused. Like, oh, it couldn't run very fast. But, excuse me, have you measured the footstep reach of T-Rex to yours? I mean, it's just like to sort of to undermine, uh, uh, not undermine, underline the word uh, to say that it could literally take a couple steps and just be like, oh, hi. Yep, continuing with that, um, if people who are listening have ever had the experience of, of trying to keep up to a large animal that's walking, be it a horse, a cow, an ostrich, or an elephant, you have to move pretty quickly to keep up with large animals just when they walk. And so T-Rex is in a, you know, in a size range that we have never experienced and never will. The planet hasn't seen terrestrial animals of that size, of that order of magnitude. And uh, so it's hard to imagine that a T-Rex walking would be very hard to escape, let alone one that could, you know, go into a fast walk. Um, people would be very vulnerable to these animals were they alive today. Yeah, that would be... Well, interesting, but maybe even terrifying to witness, but perhaps worth seeing from a safe distance and, you know, yes. in front of a cinema screen, sort of. <laughs> because, you know, one thing to see uh, an animal murdering humans in real life, that's pretty terrifying and, you know, just makes you want to run for your life. While on the other hand, if you look at it from the movie's perspective, we want to see this as often as possible. <laughs> because we just get entertained by it and that's just how crazy our mind works, I guess. <laughs> Well, I think one of the beauties of, of dinosaurs is they really make modern animals very interesting. Like, for example, in Montana, uh, we're on a ranch where we dig, and there's cattle and horses there, and, and the cattle include very large bulls. And even though they're nowhere close to the scale of size of dinosaurs, they're still big, and they're mesmerizing to watch. There's a sort of slow grace that large animals have. Just imagine what dinosaurs would have been like to behold. Obviously, movies are movies, and we are uh, we have to give them room to the wild factor. Uh, you know, to to up the wild factor a little bit, perhaps. So, do you think it's overly wild, not wild enough, or just right as far as the T Rex itself goes in the franchise? Uh, I thought that uh, there's some very beautiful moments. Um, I think that they did that they did give some thought to the animals, how they might have behaved. Um, for example, uh, in the first film where Malcolm lights the flare and the Rex sort of hones in on that visually and follows the flare back and forth and then follows it when the flare, uh, when Malcolm throws the flare. I thought that was beautiful. And... Uh, because I, I could imagine, you know, it's not too hard to imagine an animal like that reacting in that way. So the, there are some nice moments. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you this, that 
I don't think dinosaurs need any embellishment. I think they, they're they already wow factor, and they don't need to be enhanced in any way. Uh, this is something that uh, Chris Brochu ended the Sue memoir on this note, saying that T-Rex needs no embellishment. And I don't think any dinosaur needs embellishment. They're completely beyond our experience. And a dinosaur doing anything would be impressive to us. And by and large, I do think that the that the Jurassic Park films do capture that. So would a Tyrannosaurus Rex's diet in modern world consist of lawyers? <laughs> lawyers and so much more. Yep. So it's not just restricted to lawyer diet, it would be all sorts of variety of diet because, you know, nu nutrition recommendations, they require you to eat a variety of food. That was a bit of a tangent there. <laughs> but, well, anything they wanted, that's what's on the menu. I wanted to ask, what's our verdict as far as the Jurassic Park T-Rex goes? Whether are, are we letting it live and go free, or are we going to be cooking a T-Rex steak here? Uh, I guess we're, we're cooking a steak. Okay, yeah. I prefer medium. Medium? Okay. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, medium is the best, I think. So, uh, well, that wraps up the bonus content. I am hoping that viewers have enjoyed our very long and detailed discussion about the creature analysis. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me, and it's been a pleasure, and I look forward to doing this again. Definitely, likewise, and uh, I think my viewers can all say, yes, please bring him back again on the channel. We need more of him right here, right now. So, <clears throat> my voice is already dying, as you can probably tell by my intonation because talking for you know four hours I, you know it's a bit difficult and i talk a lot so yeah. that's that's the price you pay for running my channel so um thank you for coming doctor uh, once again uh, it was ak rex here dr thomas carr here thanks for watching if you want to see more of these videos please hit this thumbs up please subscribe also, don't forget to check out my Patreon. There's a, a campaign running with, uh, with which I plan to start eventually making a documentary series. It's titled Race of Arms and Armor in Mesozoic. And if you want to see this happen and you want to know more about it, either pop a question down below in the comments or just check out the link in the description box below. Until then, it's been AKREX and Dr. Thomas Carr. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you again.